Hello and welcome to Rob's Retro Reviews, and what better way is there than to start off the year than with a Games of the Year list? Now, for this list there's going to be two rules. Number one is that I'm not going to be including remasters, so don't expect to see anything like Dark Souls Remastered pop up, just because I kind of see that as being more of an enhanced port rather than a full-on new game. Rule number two is that I'm not going to be including games that I haven't personally played, so don't expect to see things like Metal Gear Survive or Fallout 76 either, just because I've not played those and to be honest I don't have any intention of ever playing those, they look really really bad. So without further ado, let's kickstart this list with my worst game of the year, number 14, which is Mario Tennis Aces. Yep, my worst game of the year is a Mario game, I didn't see that coming. I had pretty high hopes going into this that it was going to be good. I liked the idea of a Mario Tennis game with a story mode and I thought the online was going to keep me hooked for hours. However, the story mode was fully completed within a few short hours and the online felt bare bones and unrewarding, and I quickly found that the game had pretty much no content whatsoever. The game has been updated since its release and added in some new game modes, characters and tweaks to existing features. But the thing is, I paid full price for this game on release, and I shouldn't be expected to wait for the game's actual content to be drip-fed to me over the course of a year. If they were going down that route, the game should have either have been substantially cheaper, or it should have already have had a full game's worth of content to begin with. Shame on you, Nintendo. Number 13 is perhaps the most obscure game on this list. It's Frantics on the PS4. Me and my girlfriend have been collecting the PS4 Playlink games, which basically means any game that's played by using your phone as the controller. Frantics looked like it would be a fun time, basically being a Mario Party knockoff, featuring clay creatures as the playable characters. The game actually isn't all that bad, but it's quite slow paced with lots of talking and tutorials between the action, and on top of that, it feels quite look based which to some people is probably part of its charm, but for me, it's a bit of a turn off. But to be honest, the main reason this is so low on the list is because whenever we've played this with family and friends, it's not really been all that enjoyable or fun, and as a party game, that's pretty bad. Number 12 is the remake of Shadow of the Colossus. Earlier I said that remasters aren't going to be included on the list, but remakes, they're fair game. I think the overall issue with this game is that it feels exactly the same as the original PS2 game which was released in 2005. It's still clunky and the main character flops around all over the place. It can be quite a chore to climb the game's many creatures or even to do some basic platforming because the game's controls are just dated and too loose. In 2005 this wasn't too much of a big deal because the game itself was revolutionary. It was even forgivable in the 2011 remaster for PS3, with that being a straight up remaster of the PS2 release, but for a full on PS4 remake to still have these same problems is unforgivable. This is a game that didn't need a remake and doesn't benefit from the update it received. If you've played the original game or the PS3 remaster, you've already played the remake. It's not worth picking up unless you've never played it before and find the idea interesting, or if you're a really big fan. Number 11 is the one and only God of War, otherwise known as Dad of Boy. This is a controversial one to be this low on the list, and I by no means think this is a bad game, but it just isn't for me. Maybe one day I'll replay it and find something in it I didn't see before. After all, that did happen to me with Bloodborne, The Last of Us and Fallout 3, and they've become three of my favourite games ever. The problem I was having with God of War though was that it felt quite repetitive. I was killing groups of the same looking enemies for too long, going through environments that looked too samey for long periods of time, doing the same bell puzzles that were used too frequently, and I found the crafting and levelling up mechanics to be a bit overly complicated for a straight up action game like this. I feel like it's trying to be too many different things, it's trying to have an amazing narrative, be a hack and slash, have puzzles, have armour and weapon crafting, and have a complex levelling system with a skill tree, and I just thought it was a bit all over the place and caused me to be a bit disconnected from it. Again, it's not that it's a bad game, it's just that it's not for me. Number 10 is another fairly obscure one, but it's one I play quite often with family and friends, so I think it deserves a spot on the list. It's knowledge is power, decades. Yep, I've put a quiz game above God of War in a Games of the Year list. What about it? 
Knowledge is Power is another PlayLink game where you take part in a general knowledge quiz with friends and family to see who's the smartest. There's power-ups to use on your opponents and things like that that give it an element of tactics without being overwhelming. But the first game was a little bit too slow and lacked variety in the games between the standard quizzing. Knowledge is Power Decades is the second game in the series and is basically better than the first game in almost every way. It's faster paced, has more interesting power-ups, more mini-games in between the quizzing, a new mode where you exclusively do the mini-games, and a more interesting general theme, being based around questions about a specific decade, so either the 80s, 90s, noughties, or 10s. I think a wider selection of characters to pick from and perhaps even more game modes would make this one of the best quiz games in town. Number 9 is the newest instalment in the Pokemon series, and the first Pokemon game in the core series at least to be on a home console. It's Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, or Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. Going into this, I thought this was a contender for the number one spot on the list, but I kinda just found myself getting a bit bored with the basic and repetitive battle system. Maybe it's because I pretty much knew exactly what was happening at every stage because it's a remake of the Gen 1 games, or more specifically Pokemon Yellow, but for some reason this just didn't grip me like the older Pokemon games did. I do have to say though I really liked the way that catching Pokemon had become a focus again. The game uses the Pokemon Go method of catching Pokemon where you use motion controls, or if you're playing in handheld mode, gyro aiming, to throw the Pokeballs at them as they bounce and move around the screen. You would think this would make the game more interesting by adding in a brand new playstyle and lowering the amount of battling you do by eliminating the wild battles, but in the end, it just didn't have as much of an impact as I thought it was going to have. I like a ton of the ideas presented in the game, like the character customization, which I think they should make more in depth, and the catching mechanics, but I think the next core Pokemon game needs to do something drastic to keep me interested. I don't know, maybe I'm just growing out of Pokemon games or something. Number 8 is the first chapter in a new series by Toby Fox, the creator of Undertale. I would hold up the case, but it doesn't exist physically. It's Deltarune Chapter 1. For those living under a rock, Deltarune is the sequel, or prequel maybe, I guess let's just call it a spiritual successor, to Undertale. It expands on the battle system from Undertale and presents a lot of new ideas, and as to be expected, the characters and dialogue are really endearing and funny. It's quite short, but it's completely free, which is always a good thing, right? Just like with Undertale, it's probably best that you just go into this one not knowing anything about it, so I'll stop talking and just say this is worth checking out if you've got a couple of hours spare. Number 7 is perhaps a lot higher on a lot of other people's lists, but for me, it just hasn't grabbed me that much yet. It's Super Smash Bros Ultimate. I expect the more I play this one, the higher on the list it'll go, but it was only released recently, so I haven't played that much of it yet. To be honest, I wish it had a proper single player like Brawl had, because I'm not a fan of the new Spirits mode. But really, this game comes alive when you're playing it with a group of friends, and that's the reason you'll want to get this. Despite it feeling more like Super Smash Bros for Wii U Deluxe than a brand new entry in the series for me, it is the most complete version of any Smash to date, featuring every single character to have ever been in the series, and more, which is really cool. I just wish it had a story mode and event matches, and it probably would have been higher on the list. I was expecting my number 6 to be way lower down on this list, but maybe that's just because I'm typically not a fan of superheroes. It's Marvel's Spider-Man. This was a surprise. I didn't expect this game to be anywhere near as good as it was. From the initial trailer, it looked kinda quick-timey and like a lot of the action would just play out in cutscenes, but the combat and web-swinging action really is just that fluid and you're in control for all of it. There's a lot of variety in the game with the impressive combat system, the city exploration, the collectible scouting, and all of the different races, crimes, and other events you can take part in. Even if you aren't a fan of Spider-Man, this is worth checking out because it really is a great game. I don't know why I expected any less coming from Insomniac Games. It's so good in fact that it's my girlfriend's favourite game ever made, so if that's not a good review, I don't know what is. We're in the big boy section of the list now, starting with a game that was released way earlier in the year, so a lot of people have probably forgotten about it by now, but either way, coming in at number 5, it's Monster Hunter World. 
I've been a casual fan of the Monster Hunter series for years, starting with Monster Hunter Freedom on the PSP and working my way through a lot of the games after that. It seems that with every new game that's released in the series, the games just keep getting better and better. But with Monster Hunter World, there's been a massive leap forward in quality, which makes this easily the most complete and fun Monster Hunter ever. I went back to an older game in the series after this, and I actually didn't want to play it because of how dated it was compared to World. Not only is the game incredible in its current state, and it's still receiving significant updates on a regular basis, but it's also getting a massive expansion in 2019 called Iceborne, which will definitely get me playing it again when it comes out. Monster Hunter World is the perfect example of how you do content updates to your game, by already having the full game there and then just adding on top of that, rather than having the framework for a game and then making it a full game afterwards. Looking at you, Mario Tennis Aces. Number 4 impressed me so much that it's actually the reason that I was a little bit late getting this video done. I just couldn't stop playing it until I had got 100% completion on it. So, you've got Astrobot Rescue Mission to blame for the delayed video. I got this for my girlfriend for Christmas and as soon as we first put it on, we were won over by its charm and proceeded to 100% the whole thing in just a few days. Not only that, but it also introduced us to the Playroom VR, which we've also now got 100% on too. Astrobot Rescue Mission is a PSVR 3D platformer, which you would think would have to take place from a first-person perspective with it being a VR game. And to an extent, you're right. The game takes place from the perspective of a big robot, but the character you actually control is a little robot who the big robot is watching. The game's controls are very simple, having a jump button and an attack button, and giving you a hover move which is extremely satisfying to use. As far as the main inputs the game uses, that's about it. The level design could also be seen as being quite simple too. It's very linear and straightforward, and if this hadn't been a VR game, I actually think it would have been quite mediocre. But the thing is, this is a VR game, which opens it up to having loads of interesting gimmicks that utilise motion controls in many different ways. For example, this stuff that uses the DualShock 4 controller, like having to shoot hooks out to allow Astrobot to walk across them. You'll have a water gun which allows you to spray enemies and put out fires. You'll have a torch which allows you to see hidden platforms and defeat ghosts. And you'll have a paint gun which gives you a projectile attack. But then on top of the basic DualShock motion controls, there's also the VR headset itself which is used to great effect. Having you move out of the way of enemy projectiles and headbutt things to open up secret areas for Astrobot to explore. And then there's the way you can look around and peek over cliffs and around corners to find hidden collectibles that Astrobot can then collect. It's incredibly immersive and is one of the most impressive VR games I've ever played. It's a game that's straight up enhanced by being in VR, and even though it could be seen as being gimmicky for no reason, the gimmicks are used to such good effect that I think they really lift the game to a new level. The game's bosses are also incredible and have to be experienced in the headset to really put across how impressive they are. This is an absolute must play if you have a PSVR. I would actually go as far as to say that this is perhaps the main killer app for the device at the moment. Don't let its initial simplicity fool you, this game is much deeper than it initially looks. We're in the top three area of the video now, exciting stuff. My number three is actually a trilogy of games that I've played quite a lot throughout my life, but this year they received an awesome remake that just completely blew me away. It's the Spyro Reignited trilogy. I've done a full review of the Spyro Reignited trilogy, and the original trilogy for that matter, so I won't go into too much detail here. But yeah, this is the definitive way of experiencing the Spyro trilogy, and it's an amazing remake that's far superior to the Crash Bandicoot Insane trilogy that came out in 2017. It looks amazing, adds content onto the original experience, but it also keeps the original experience completely intact. It also improves the controls to be more in line with modern games, which is a nice touch and feels incredible. Even if you've never played Spyro before, you need to check this out. And if you have played Spyro before, you need to play this even more because you'll appreciate the upgrade the games have received. I can only hope that Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled is as good as this when it comes out. 
To be honest, my number one and two in this video are kind of interchangeable, and the reason for that is because they're completely different, so it was hard to categorise them properly. When you see what my number one is, you'll probably understand where I'm coming from. But for now, my number two is Overcooked 2. This is one of the very best co-op games I've ever played. The sense of accomplishment you feel after getting the highest rank on a level with a partner is amazing, and the game has tons of charm with its varied levels and zany cast of playable characters. For those that don't know what this is, Overcooked is a cooking game which is built from the ground up to be played cooperatively with up to three other people. The different kitchens are designed so that only certain players can do certain things. So you'll find yourselves having to shout at each other and work together to finish the dishes as quick and efficiently as possible without burning everything to the ground. I only got around to playing the original Overcooked this year and I honestly can't believe I hadn't played it until that point. After fully finishing the original one, I went out and pre-ordered this one instantly, and when it arrived, it didn't disappoint. It's better than the original in almost every way, and is even more frantic with the new throwing ability and levels that transform and change as you're cooking in them. I can't recommend this enough if you're a fan of co-op games, and to be honest, it even has a really fun competitive mode too. Although, I tend to stick to the main co-op mode for the most part. I feel like the only thing that could really do to make Overcooked 3 even better is perhaps to have a proper single player mode. But I don't know how they would make that work, and I wouldn't want that to be the focus or take away from the main co-op mode. Finally, we're at the number one spot, and surprising nobody, it's Red Dead Redemption 2. I bet you didn't see that one coming. In the weeks leading up to this game being released, I actually wasn't all that bothered about it. I hadn't played any previous Red Dead game, and so I didn't really have any expectations for it. So I pre-ordered it on a whim, and I'm damn glad that I did because it turned out to be incredible. The story it tells is interesting and powerful, the gameplay is varied and tight, there's so, so, so much content to get through, and it's just an extremely good game. Everything about it is as high quality as you can currently get in gaming, and it's an absolute must play. Even ignoring the online mode completely, there's hours and hours worth of content, but if you want more, there is the online mode on top of the single player. I've not played this too much, but it seems really fun, and it's only in its beta stage at the time this video was made. I'm not a fan of extortionate microtransactions, which could become a problem for the game, but only time will tell just how much of a problem it is. The main single player mode though is almost perfect. There's so much to do and every mission gives you something new and interesting to try out, or develops the huge but very real feeling cast of characters in some way. I honestly didn't think this would be anywhere near as good as it is, and since finishing it I've gone out and got Red Dead Revolver, Red Dead Redemption, and Red Dead Redemption Undead Nightmare to give all of those a go too. I can't believe I've been missing out on this series for all this time, and I want to try them all out. So there we go, that's every game I've played this year, ranked. Now, there are quite a few other games that came out this year that look incredible that I've just not got around to playing yet. So, this section of the video is going to be a sort of honourable mentions area, where I just go through some of the games that I've not had time for. A Way Out is a pretty big one that I wanted to play with my girlfriend, being a game built from the ground up as a co-op experience. I'm pretty sure I'll end up getting this near the beginning of 2019, because I really liked Brothers A Tale Of Two Sons, and it's made by the same team as that. Hitman 2 is another one I want to give a go, because I loved the older games in the series, more specifically Hitman Blood Money. But before I play this one, I should probably play the Hitman reboot that came out in 2016, so it'll probably be a while until I get to this. Kirby Star Allies looks like it would be a fun time, but it didn't really look like anything too special, which basically put me off of getting it because other things were coming out at the same time that I wanted more. I kinda just saw this as being a filler game for the Switch, but let me know if you enjoyed it. I've not seen too much of it, so it might be a hidden gem that I missed. Life is Strange 2 is another one I really want to play. The first season of Life is Strange is the best interactive drama game I've ever played, and is perhaps the most emotional game I've ever experienced. So the sequel has a lot to live up to, and I hope it hits that extremely high bar I've set for it. I'm not a huge fan of the episodic format in games, so I might wait until it's all out and then get the physical version before I try this. 
And plus, I've got Life is Strange Before the Storm to play, because I haven't got on around to that yet either. Then there's the smaller indie games that came out this year that I've not played too, so things like Celeste, Night in the Woods, Flint Hook, Ashen, and Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, which I really want to get around to. So let me know if any of those really impressed you. I've heard really good things about Celeste in particular, so I really should get around to that. In the meantime, I'm waiting for all of the amazing games to come out in 2019. There's absolutely loads that I'm looking forward to getting my hands on, but that's a topic for another video. So that's it, I hope you enjoyed the list. Maybe there was something on there you wasn't expecting or didn't know about that you want to try out now. If so, let me know in the comments below, and also let me know if there's anything you think I missed or that you disagree with. And until next time, bye!